Help us, always, God, to be in a state of readiness. Oh, my God, that when you return, Lord God, we can hear well done. Help us, oh, God, in the name of Jesus, to look to the mirror of the word of God and ensure that we have aligned ourselves to your word. Oh, my God, it makes no sense to come week after week. Lord God and Lord God, be lost. And so we ask, oh, God, that you would send us help. We ask, oh, God, that you would send us strength. Oh, mighty God, your strength is made perfect in our weakness. Oh, mighty God, tonight, oh, God, build us up, oh, God, in our most holy faith. Help us, oh, God, to be about your business. Help us, oh, God, to be more kingdom-minded, oh, God, knowing, oh, God, that this earth, oh, God, Lord God, one of these days, oh, God, hallelujah, oh, God, it shall be dissolved. Oh, my God, one of these days, the very earth, oh, God, will roll like a scroll. Oh, mighty God, but, Lord, we want to ensure that our lives, oh, God, hallelujah, are hid with Christ and God, that when you shall appear, we shall appear with you in glory. Oh, my God, in the name of Jesus, root up and tear down everything that's not like you, everything, oh, God, that has not been surrendered to you. We surrender it tonight. Oh, my God, wash us, oh, God. Make us, oh, God, clean. Help us, oh, God, you said be clean. Oh, God, that bear the vessel of the Lord. Oh, my God, we want, oh, God, our lives to be of such, oh, God, that you can come and you can dwell. We want our lives to be of such, oh, God, that, Lord God, you can be comfortable in us, oh, God. Mighty God, in the name of Jesus, take over tonight. Ah, oh, God, you get your glory. Mighty God, you get your honor. Mighty God, you get your praise. You are deserving of our worship. You are deserving of, oh God, the glory. Mighty God, I honor you tonight. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you for what you're doing. Oh, my God, help us to learn to be content in whatever state we're in. Help us, oh God, not to run after the world. Ah, mighty God, in the name of Jesus, help us, oh God, to, oh God, run after you. Help us to crave the things, oh God, that honors you. Ah, my God, the things that pleases you. Oh, my God, hallelujah. Root up and tear out everything in us, oh God, that's not like you. Everything that does not exalt you in my life. In our lives, oh God, I pray that you would, oh God, allow us to see it and get rid of it, oh God. That when you return, oh God, you will find us, oh God, without spots. You will find us, oh God, without wrinkle. That our lives will be clean in the name of Jesus. Oh my God, we know no sin. Get out, oh God, Lord Jesus, enter. And so God, wash us again. Mold us again. Consecrate us again. Tear out, oh God, everything, oh God. Every vain imagination. Everything in our lives that exalted itself above you. Tear it down for your glory. Tear it down for your honor. Tear it down for your praise. Oh my God, hallelujah. I want to be like you, Lord. We desire to be like you. Oh, my God, I pray tonight that you will forgive us of every sin, every unrighteous thought, every unrighteous deed, everything within us, oh, God, hallelujah, that's really just not like you. I pray, oh, God, that we will, oh, God, get rid of it, oh, God, Lord God, that we may be a clean church, that we'll be a church, oh, God, where your presence always abide in the name of Jesus, that we will feel your anointing, oh God, that your anointing will run from breath to breath in the name of Jesus. 
that every time we enter these doors, Lord God, we will feel your presence. Lord God, we cannot, oh God, live, oh God, without your presence, oh God. No wonder the word says it's in your presence that there is fullness of joy. It is at your right hand where there are pleasures forevermore. Have your way tonight, oh mighty God, hallelujah. Speak to us tonight. Speak to our hearts tonight, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Oh, my God, that we will be transformed. Oh, my God, hallelujah. Renew our hearts, oh God, renew our minds. Oh, my God, in the name of Jesus, it is our desire, Lord, to really please you. Lord God, to really honor you. Mighty God, you have been faithful. You have been good. Hallelujah. I down through the years. Oh God, hallelujah. I praise you tonight. I exalt you tonight. I honor you tonight, Jesus. You are worthy of the praise. You are worthy of the glory. You are worthy of the honor. In the name of Jesus. Remember those that are on their way. I pray for them tonight. May you give them journey mercies, oh God. May you cover them under your blood. Would you allow your angels to encamp around about them? Ah, my God, whatever mode or method of transportation, oh God, that they'll be taken to come to your house tonight. I pray, oh God, that you would send your angels, oh my God, to encamp around about them in the name of Jesus. Oh, mighty God, tonight, remember those that are not well tonight. Oh God, all of our shut-ins, oh God. Remember Mother Henry, oh God, in the hospital. Mighty God, you still the bomb in Gilead. You are still a healer. You are still a deliverer, Lord. May you strengthen our body oh God. May you give us speedy recovery. Remember Mother Powell, oh God. Remember Mother Bryant, oh God. Mother Hicklin, Mother Castro, oh God. Mother Anderson, oh God. Mother, oh God, Vickers. Oh God, Mother Sharp, oh God. Mother, oh God, Leslie. Oh God, Mother Lord Jesus Daly. Oh my God, Mother Campbell. Remember seniors, oh God. And their steps are getting shorter. Remember, says the Harvey's dad, mighty God. You are faithful to that promise. You are the God that keeps your word. I ask that you breathe upon them tonight. Breathe upon them tonight. In the name of Jesus, let your will be done. Let your divine purpose be wrought. And God, we will ever, oh God, oh God, be created. We will ever, Lord God, be mindful to give you the glory, mighty God, to give you the honor and the praise. Remember, young people, oh God, I pray their strength tonight. I pray that your mighty hands will rest upon them. Oh, my God, give them the strength. Give them the spirit of endurance, oh God. We know, God, the forces, oh God, are against them. But God, greater is, oh God, you that's in them than he that's in the world. Oh God, strengthen them, oh God. Let them not become wearied in well-doing. Let them not faint, but enable them, oh God. Lord, got to stand in these closing times. Oh mighty God, remember my leaders tonight, I present every one of them before you. Oh my God, anoint them afresh. Oh God, a fresh rain of word. Oh my God, in the name of Jesus, that, oh God, when we come before, oh God, Lord God, your people, oh God, it'll be a right now word. It'll be an on time word. It'll be a word, oh God, that will destroy yokes in the name of Jesus. Oh God, remember, oh God, the middle aged, oh God, Lord God, I pray for them, oh God. May you strengthen us, oh God. May you give us grace, hallelujah. May you enable us to stand, oh God. In these last and closing days, may your God, hallelujah, build us in every capacity. 
surrender of my life. Remember those that have not surrendered their lives to you. Lord God, if you don't draw them, oh God, they cannot come. And so I pray that you'll draw them in the name of Jesus. And that you will give them a mind and a desire to surrender their will. A mind and a desire that they will surrender their way. Lord God, knowing, oh God, that you're coming. Lord God, we know not the day nor the hour. But God, it's our desire, oh my God, to be saved. It is our desire to see our loved ones saved. And so we bring every person, oh God, we bring set up and look for you. This community, oh God, I pray, oh God, that your words will, oh God, permeate, oh God, this community, oh God, and transform their lives, oh God. Pull down the strongholds, oh God, and set up and so God, their lives, oh God, will be changed. Oh, for your glory, Lord God, not that man would get the praise and the honor, but that you would get all the glory. Oh, God, remember every person that walked through these doors. Let them feel the love of God. Hallelujah. May they feel your strength and your deliverance, oh God. May you minister to them. Remember our online viewers tonight. I present every one of them, oh God. May you open their hearts and their minds, oh God, to receive, oh God, that which you have prepared for us tonight. Help us, oh God, to really sit and listen, oh God. Lord God, and oh God, meditate on these words, oh God. Knowing one day this word, oh God, will not be able to be preached in the fashion, oh God, which it is being preached now. And so I pray, oh God, that we will grab a hold of the word and Lord God that we will be oh God the one you're calling for these last and closing days send your anointing tonight sit up on a pastor tonight uh, give him oh God a rhema word a word oh God hallelujah Lord God that will cause our heart to burn within us oh God a word oh God that will minister to our spirit oh God and will cause transformation send your anointing upon him oh Oh God, give him wisdom beyond his years. Anoint him afresh, oh God. Strengthen his body, oh God. Bless his family, oh God. Lord Jesus, and use them, oh God, for this last day harvest. Father God, we commit everything into your hands today. Lord God, that which I failed to ask tonight, fail not to grant. According to your divine purpose, oh God. According to your excellent power. In Jesus' name, I wonder, can we put our hands together and bless the Lord tonight? Can we put our hands together and bless him tonight? Hallelujah! He's worthy of the praise, and he's worthy of the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, amen, we're going to ask our pastor to come, amen, and allow the Lord to use him for his glory. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much, Minister Ferguson. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord together tonight. Amen, brethren. God is good. Amen. God is a good God. Amen. And um, as is customary but sincere, I hope you had a very good day today. Amen. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well. Amen. It is well. Amen. It is well. It is well. It is well. We give the Lord thanks for his goodness to us. Amen. We're going to go to the word of the Lord tonight. We're reading from uh, Acts chapter 1, portion of Acts chapter 1. I'm going to ask uh, if you could locate that in your Bibles. Acts chapter 1. Amen. Uh, we are focusing tonight on becoming a personal evangelist. Uh, becoming a personal evangelist. And uh, before we read Acts chapter 1, you know, I was thinking earlier today, as we go through these lessons, the Lord will allow 
Uh, we have two more Tuesday evenings. The Lord allows to uh, complete these couple of lessons. As you're aware by now, I believe, Lord willing, the second week of August, um, the Tuesday evenings are going to be on the outside as we did last year. Um, and the focus, of course, would be uh, just to impact our community with the word of the Lord. Um, so that's going to be our focus. Um, soul winning. Of course, we're going to be doing two weekends, back-to-back -back weekends, Lord willing, in August. Uh, Friday, Saturday, and uh, Sunday. And then the following week, we're doing the same, Lord willing. Um, we we want to... We want to maximize the heat, right, Sister Harvey? <laughs> we want to maximize the warmth. There's coming a time when we are not going to be able to work. Jesus did say that we must work the work of him that sent us while it is day. The night cometh when no man will be able to work. Amen. Let's read Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Then I have you seated. But he shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. You know, just look at the construct of the verse, uh, how definitive the statements stated there are. Uh, ye shall receive power, shall, promise. See that? Ye shall be witnesses. See that, brethren? So you shall receive power, it's you and I, and you shall be witnesses unto me. Amen. We're going to, um, you, you can be seated, brethren. So we have been looking at, um, we did look at the church, we did look at uh, the pastor's main responsibilities and tonight we are looking at, continuing to look at the flock's main responsibilities. As we go through these lessons, um, not just this particular one tonight, but brethren, um, if at all you have questions, um, perhaps going to ask Sister Matthews to, to help us, um, perhaps on a Tuesday evenings, for the next couple of Tuesday evenings, we just put a basket at the back with bits of paper. Uh, I know there are times when there are brethren who you may have questions, but you feel a little cute, uh, feel a little shy. Not to ask me, but you don't want the next person. You may not want the next person to hear the question that you've got. And so I just want to make sure that if there are questions, that you know that you have an opportunity to whether stand and indicate and will allow you at the end to ask your question or if you just want to put it on a bit of paper so that we can respond. It makes no sense we teach and you have questions that would bring perhaps clarity to something you are, um, well, it might just be a struggle or just an observation. We would want you to be able to ask the question. And I promise you this, that if I don't have the answer, I'll go get it for you and come back another time. God's willing. Amen, brethren. So I want you to be free enough to, to ask the questions. Um, some of these, it might be very easy for you to ask questions on this topic. Uh, but when we begin to look at uh, the church etiquettes, and there are a couple of areas I've made mention that I want to talk about, I want you to be free enough to ask any question you have there, um, and I'll give you the answer. And we'll find the answer. And if there is no answer for this one, we'll tell you there is none. We need to go back and pray and ask God to give. Amen? We, I won't give you an answer. Uh, because we can think of one has to be based on the word of the Lord. Amen. All right. So tonight we are looking at becoming a personal evangelist. Anybody inside here you want to, be, to become a personal evangelist? Anybody like that? Want to be? Amen. I've got news for you. You are. You just don't know it. And so that's what we're going to be focused on tonight. Now, let's first look at just what personal evangelism is. Um, last week, we, we considered, and on Sunday, we did look at the very first um, 
focus for the flock, which is building and maintaining right relationship with Jesus Christ. You remember that? And I want you to remember that because everything is uh, built upon that. It's predicated upon that. If there is no right relationship, then living the life of a personal evangelist is going to be impossible. So right relationship is, is absolutely, it's foundation. It's essential. It's, it's a must. And when there is that right relationship with God, then everything else is going to be built upon that. Everything will become a little easier. Amen? Where there is no relationship with God, obviously, we're not going to be true witnesses. Because we're going to be afraid to talk. We're going to be convicted. We're not going to walk in fellowship. We're not going to have unity as we need to if there is not a right relationship with God. And so we're building on that, going on to uh, lesson number two, becoming a personal evangelist. So personal evangelism is communicating the message of the gospel one-on-one. -on -one. Essentially, that's what it is. It's communicating this great message one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, you'll, if you have not gotten your, did you get notes just yet? You'll get it. It's my fault. I'm usually a little late to, to ask for it to be printed. Uh, but you'll get it before you in a little while. So it is one on one. And, and at the end of this lesson, I want us to do a little, I want us to go to math class. And we're going to do a little mathematics uh, just to see uh, what could happen if we were all engaged in this um, ministry of evangelism. As I said before, all of us are called and are expected to be uh, personal evangelists. Jesus did say in Acts 1, 8, we read earlier, ye shall be witnesses unto me. Ye shall. And so as we abide in him, it's automatic that we are going to be witnesses. We are going to be light and we're going to be salt. We're going to allow our light to so shine before men that they are going to see our good works. When, when there is right relationship, brethren, a lot of the things that we struggle to do, it's not going to be so hard after all. If we abide in him, it's automatic. If you have a well, you can go ahead. Thank you so very much. Um, if we plant some seeds and we allow it to be in the right environment, uh, a couple of months ago when we started the junior uh, children's discipleship class, the first lesson we did was seed planting. And uh, courtesy of one of our brothers, uh, got a little, some seeds. Just at the time, I think we had five of them in the class. And we, we may have had five seeds or six seeds, Bishop. And each of them received one. And I gave them a little um, flower, a little pot. And they planted the seed. I provided the soil. And we did the little demo in the hallway upstairs. And they did their stuff, and each of them put that one seed in. Uh, we had broccoli and uh, tomato, I believe, if my memory serves me right. And each of them planted, and they, we did our little water, watering. And we left it upstairs for a little bit, and we spoke on the lesson, and we told them about the process of germination. And they would water, they would come after a few Sundays, and they saw no life. Nothing was happening, it seemed. But then, after a while, they started to see signs of life. Signs of life. You see the little bud coming up, and afterwards, they began to um, boast a little bit uh, on each, right, Brother Josiah, on each other, because some were a little taller, or some were seeing signs, and some weren't. And we, of course, had to encourage them. That's just the process of growth and development. Initially, you're going to see nothing. But if you keep on doing the right thing, if you keep that plant, that pot in the right environment and provide the appropriate amount of water, then after a while, something is going to happen. And so the point I'm making is that when we have a right relationship with God, after a while, something is going to happen. The, the things that we are anticipating... The, the, the family members that we want to 
to see saved if we remain in a right relationship with God, something is going to happen. Our lives will convict them of sin. Our lives. But if we are not in a right relationship, we are going to not pull them to God. We're going to push them away from him. Because the truth is, um, for persons who never had a relationship with God, the only time they're going to see God is, is in us. It's through us. And so if we claim to know him in speech, but our lifestyle is opposite to that, then they are not going to want my God. They're not going to want yours. They are going to despise our God. Why? Based on the presentation that they see. But if we have a right relationship and we're living right under pressure and we're seeking to please God and when we make mistakes, we say, I'm sorry, and we get up and we go again, that is going to encourage them. Because they don't expect us to be perfect because we aren't. But they're going to they're gonna appreciate our humanity, our honesty. You know, and I find that that type of ministry is so powerful, you know, brethren. When you and I can avail, can express our vulnerabilities to each other. When we don't suggest to the next person that we are so perfect. And we have never made a mistake. I mean, everybody knows that that's a lie. Eh? But sometimes we kind of project that image. And then the man who really wants to come and know God and sees and or hears how perfect we are, he's going to go away because there's never, it's not going to be possible in, in his mind at least for him to be able to measure up to the presentation that we would have given. But, if, but the point I'm making again is this, if we abide in him, if we have right relationship with him, then everything else is going to be automatic. We're going to win souls. And, and I almost say we don't even have to try, but we will have to try. Uh, but it's going to complement. It's going to be easier because of our lifestyle. People will just see you sometime and want to come to your church without you giving a word with your lips. Because they would have observed the word of your life. Um, we probably look at that a little bit. So it's personal evangelism is one-on-one -on -one evangelism. Um, it is informing the individual that Jesus Christ did a couple of things. One, that he died for our sins. Our sins. And that he rose again from the dead. That is the in, that's what we are presenting to people. He died for our sins. And he rose again from the dead. And our intention in this process really is to lead people, the unsaved, the full New Testament salvation. We personal, a personal evangelist is not just comfortable to invite somebody to church. It's beyond that. It's, it has to be beyond that. You want to see the unsaved converted. You, you don't even just want to see them get the Holy Ghost and get baptized. That's a part of the process and you're excited for that. But then you also recognize the need to go beyond the initial encounter and become a disciple, a convert, transformed by the word of God. And so that's the focus of the personal evangelist. Want to see that person become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, the witness, the witness's duty is to be fully engaged in this process of uh, propagating the gospel. Sharing it like seed. You are, wherever you go, you are sharing this truth. Because you want everybody to hear, to know, and have a response. An opportunity rather to respond. And there's one thing about the gospel that we could I probably just say no. Is that, you know, our job really, brethren, is just to share it, you know. It's just to live it. Because it's powerful by itself. The word of God is what? Quick and what? Sharper than any two-edged sword. So the word of God is able to do what the word of God needs to do. My responsibility and yours is to share it with my lips and with my life. And when I begin to walk and share, when I become the Bible... 
when I become the living word, so they are seeing the word at work, they are going to be impacted by that. And the truth is, people can dispute the authenticity of the word, the written word. But when they see that written word, when they see it manifesting in my life, they can't argue with that. When, when it, worse when they know where you're coming from, what you used to do. And you came to a little church, 20524 Hollis Avenue. And you came in contact with Jesus Christ. And you were transformed. Literally transformed. Step by step, but transformation is happening. And the desires for the things that they, they knew you loved. And they are recognizing you no longer have taste for it anymore. They are going to be challenged by that. When they lift it and show it before your face, hoping that it would entice you, and you'll say, no, I, that's not me anymore. They are going to be convicted that of a truth, something has happened to you. And there are a lot of people who want a different life, but just don't think that a different life is possible. But when they see you and I modeling that different life, the life that they always wanted but just thought they could never have, they are going to be challenged by that. They are going to begin to believe that this is possible, that I can live this life too. And so that is our job, propagating this gospel with a view of leading others to Jesus Christ. Now, every member here at UAC, we must see ourselves as personal evangelists. And we have a God-given mandate to share this message, which is the gospel. Every member in the room, and those who are not in the room tonight, are members, we must see ourselves as personal evangelists. Before anything else, the pastor must be a personal evangelist. The singers and the musicians and the Sunday school teachers and the, everybody in the church, anybody and everybody, we must first see ourselves as personal evangelists. That's who we are. That's what Acts 1a tells us. Ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And as a result of that encounter, ye shall be witnesses unto me. And he, of course, the Lord began to declare where? Your Jerusalem, which is hometown. Your home. In Judea, a little further, Samaria. You keep on going, and then, of course, to the utmost part of the earth. And so, brethren, I'm not just trying to say words. I'm really wanting to engage your thoughts and, and hope that you can see the word for what it's saying. Every one of us, as members of this house, we must see ourselves as personal evangelists. And don't begin to tell me what your capacity is. Your capacity is and how you can't do so and so that's not true you are a personal evangelist remember that lady with the, the bad reputation in the book of john a samaritan woman the kind of woman she was but she came in contact with jesus christ and after going to bible school for seven years what did she do After getting her ministerial credentials, after going to a discipleship class for six months, it was after that time, right, she began to evangelize, right? No, no, no. Same time, she had an encounter. He ministered to her. He revealed himself to her. And what was the first thing she did? She said, no, this is too good to keep quiet. She went back to where she was afraid of going, into the city. She was no longer shy or ashamed because of her lifestyle. She ran. She got boldness. Come see a man who told me everything that I ever did. 
Is not this the Christ? Wasn't a question. It's a rhetorical statement. It's a statement of fact. He is the Christ. So there's nobody who can disqualify, nobody in this room. You don't have the opportunity to disqualify yourself because of your past, because of your situation. No, no, no. You are a witness. You have the Holy Ghost, you're a witness. You may not be functioning, but you cannot disqualify yourself. Because, and don't tell me too, one of the things you hear people say, oh, I don't know what to say. Say what you know. Say what you know. We have steps sometimes. We say what you know. I was a dog and Jesus saved me. I used to smoke. I used to drink. I used to whatever. Powerful testimonies. Powerful testimonies. You know why? Because somebody had an encounter, an experience. And that person shared a testimony. And people are saved. So you cannot say, you cannot lean on that stick that say, oh, I don't know what to say. Come on, you have Holy Ghost power in you. And remember, I did say that everything is going to be predicated on the right relationship with God. Because if you're walking and growing in your relationship with God, then he's going to empower you. He's going to inspire you. He's going to show you and tell you what to say. Told you of a crazy experience I had some years ago. I believe I did share it. When I just recently got saved, Sister Jillian. And I just felt the Lord, you know, you need to go into your community and do some touch people's lives. Share the gospel. And I was like, me alone? What am I going to say? I'm a, I'm a new convert. And I felt so convicted. Um, Sister Abby. I decided, yes, I'm going to do this. And I thought I had to dress up like going to church. So that Monday morning after the Sunday service, Sister Odette, I dressed up in my one pants and one shirt I had at the time. I don't remember if I had my, my tie on. And I went giving tracks and talking to people, asking people if they want the Holy Ghost. On the street corner, and I'm thinking after, I'm saying, oh, you must, you, are you for real? But I had an encounter, and I know that God was able to do it. But it was beyond, you know, it's not something that I would have just ran into. That was not my personality. But I, and I told you about the gentleman, in his, his name was Ezekiel. That morning I had that devotion, I went through, and the very th thing I read in Ezekiel was in Jeremiah. I was walking, and the Lord prompted me with this man. I thought, no, he is too rough. He didn't look like a candidate. You know, sometimes we, we are so foolish. Oh, no, him, him no want the Lord. Him, him want to smoke and so and so. And I was trying to pass him, and I almost passed, and I just felt the Lord. I was not at ease, Bishop. Turned back and shivering, afraid. I said, hello. I am told him my name from United, well, it wasn't United Apostolic Church, was it? Pentecostal Tabernacle. And I'm in the area, and, and I allowed me to have the conversation with him. Came out of his house, he was doing, and I was just brushing his teeth or something. You know, in Jamaica, and some of them dressing his underpants and nothing else. And he was at the front of his yard doing whatever he was doing. And he bid me, I went, and I, I thought I turned fool. I just skipped for my devotion, because I didn't have a prepared text to talk to this man. And the first thing he said after that was, why did you choose to use my name? Went to Ezekiel. His name was Ezekiel. They didn't ask him his name. And I read it and skipped away and go to Jeremiah. What, uh, and it was the same thing. And that was an encounter for me and for him. So the point I'm, I'm wanting to make with that is, your brethren, that we have a mandate to share we don't need to be afraid of what to say. If you are willing, if I'm willing, if I make myself available, God is going to use me. Don't be intimidated by what you call your inability to, to say it like so-and-so. You don't need to say it like so-and-so. You just need to share it as you understand it from the word. Amen?
And the word of God is powerful. If you share it in Patwa, in English, in Chinese, have you ever noted that? You share the word of God. However it is shared, whatever language, it is powerful. So let's not keep quiet. Let's talk about Jesus. Amen. So all of us are called to be witnesses and we must ensure that as members of the body, we give ourselves to that. A witness is somebody who would have had a personal encounter, personal experience, and then they begin to relay that information to the subject of the conversation. So you had an encounter, and I'm sharing with you what my encounter was with the hope that you will hear and believe and respond to the gospel. So a witness is somebody who, and when you look at the Greek for witness, it's martyrs in the Greek, and that's where we get our English word martyr from, willingness to die for the cause. And so it gets a little bit intense perhaps. It's not, not just a casual conversation. When you look at the origin of this particular language, um, the Lord was saying to them, listen, I want you to know that the ministry that I have called you to may require your life. And I want you to be prepared to give your life. And um, you know the traditions. Um, all save in one, we are told, of the apostles were martyred. All save in one. But look what has happened. Look at how they would have turned the world upside down so the, the the martyr the weakness must be prepared to share this great gospel to everybody all of us in this room i believe all those who are saved you know sufficient enough of this gospel to tell somebody else you know enough you know enough you don't need to know everything. You just need to know enough. And you would have known enough because you would have had the experience. You can tell how you were convicted by the word. You can talk about uh, what you used to do and thought that you could never get the victory over it. But then you came in contact with Jesus Christ and something just happened. Supernatural. Powerful. Something that you can't explain. You can share that. So all of us must recognize we have a responsibility uh, to share this great gospel. Now what is the gospel? What's the message? It's very simplistic. It's, it's not deep theology. It is so simple that everybody can share it. So... We see in your notes, you'll note 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 3 and 4. Um, before we go to that slide, why is it that we need to know the gospel though? Um, I need to know the gospel because number one, I am commanded to preach it. All of us in this room, we are commanded to, to preach the gospel. And don't be fooled. Preaching is not when somebody comes at a podium and, and shout for half an hour for 45 minutes and sweaty and run there and there. That's just personality. That's just style. That's just you. That's just the person. You share it how you can. You don't have to come and run. Just stand up and talk. Use your own language. Yeah? Don't be like somebody else. I feel like shouting here. That's not you. You don't have to do that. You just stand up and talk and be yourself. People will appreciate that. So I need to know the gospel because I am commanded to preach it. I need to know the gospel number two because if I preach erroneously, another gospel, there's a curse attached to me. I'm cursed if I preach the false gospel. And, and I want to make this point. You may be sharing something with somebody. And in 
trying to make a point, you might use the wrong illustration. So instead of saying Zacchaeus, you're saying Zebediah. That's not what it's talking about. It, it, what it's talking about are those who say, you know what, they, 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 they are exposed to truth, but they decide that they have some newer revelation, a newer way, and so deliberately their intent is to convince others, to convince people of something that is totally fabricated, something that is opposed to, opposite to the word of God. So the one who does that, a curse is attached. So in sharing and you make a mistake, well, I'm not going to say anything because if I make a mistake, I'm cursed. No, that's not true. That's not what it's saying. And if you know your God and my God is not like that, I think God is going to, you're trying to tell a story and you use the wrong character and God is going to curse you because you, you, you said Zacchaeus instead of Zebediah. That's not the God we serve, right? That's not the God that we serve. Amen. So the one who preaches opposite, and Paul warned the brethren in the book of Galatians chapter 1. You want to pull that up for me, uh, Sister Candice, Galatians chapter 1, 6 to 9. Galatians chapter 1, um, 6 to 9. Paul had a hard time dealing with these brethren in Galatia. I marvel, he said in verse 6, that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, and I want you to note the examples he used there, though we the apostles, and, and that's a powerful way to present it because he's saying don't take our words for it. If we are not preaching truth, don't follow us. Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. And he said it again. He reemphasized the point in verse 9. As we said before, so say, no, again, I know again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than ye have received, let him be accursed. Because there are those who are preaching other gospels which are not the gospel at all. Telling you you can live any way you want to live and still make it in. Telling you you can die in your sins and some member of some clergy can just pray a prayer over you. What foolishness is that in brethren? But a lot of people believe that. To you and I, that's ridiculous, isn't it? But there are millions of people who think it is true. Now, you see the responsibilities, the responsibility that is placed on our shoulders. Because if there are so many who are fooled by something that is not true, and you and I know truth, and we keep our mouths shut. See how wicked we are? It's like you see gunmen going into your neighbor's house. Long guns, and you know they are gunmen. And you just turn off your light, go under your bed, and go to sleep. You'd be wicked, right? You'd be wicked. You'd be just as wicked as the gunmen. Because at least you could make a call. And you did nothing. So the point I'm making, very exaggerated um, example, but the point I'm making is we have truth. We then have a responsibility to share truth with all people. We can't be quiet about it. And I know as a people, we tend to be on the quiet side, you know. We tend to be slow to go on the street and we tend to be the ones in our workplaces to keep our mouths shut. And I'm being general, right? Just speaking generally. But there are others who, they don't have this truth, you know, brethren. But they're always talking. They go on the bus and the train and they're preaching. They're, they're, they're sharing what they have. We have to do better, right? 
We have to be the evangelists that God has called us to be. Third reason why we must know the gospel is because people's eternity depends on it. People's eternity. Would you want a doctor to operate on you who never studied? Just get up and say, I'm a doctor. I feel like a doctor. Would you, and you know that. Would you go to see him? You're not going to go to see him, right? Because you don't trust his ability. You don't think he knows what he should. He's not in a position, you would think, to perform that surgery on you. So we need to spend time in learning the basics of the gospel. The basic, the fundamentals. Not everybody in churches, in any church, will be very... Not everybody's going to go, for want of a better term, to do some deep theological study at some seminary, some university. Not everybody's going to do that. Some will, but not everybody. And that's okay. But all of us must know what one needs to do to be saved and to remain saved. Amen? All of us must know the basics. The basics just by itself is powerful. After all, it was the basics anyway that brought us in. And so even those who went to do further studies, the only reason why we were able to do further studies is because we first had an encounter with the limited knowledge and that was sufficient to bring us into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. So you know the basics, that's good. Let's use that to help others. Amen? So in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Paul says to the brethren at Corinth, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. I'm giving you what I got. You, I want you to know that. He's talking to the Corinthians, and he's saying, What I'm sharing, what I'm saying, what I've been telling you is not something that I made up. It is something that I received. Amen? So I'm delivering what I received. How that Christ died for our sins, according to what? The scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. So he's talking one about the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, in that very first verse, there are four key words that describes his redemptive death. Number one, it talks about um, the fact that Jesus Christ was our sacrifice. Christ died for our sins. And he's talking to a, a, a congregation who are kind of very familiar with uh, the practices of Judaism. Uh, they would be very familiar uh, with the impartation of sins that um, happen in the Old Testament. Um, where the hands of the priesthood was laid on the goat and he would flee outside and eventually he would die. They, they're familiar with just the different processes of worship, of sacrifice. So when he's talking about sacrifice, Christ being uh, our sacrifice, they, they understood that Christ died for us. And so one of the things that I want to do in being a personal evangelist is to be able to share with people that listen, Christ died, Jesus Christ died for our sins. Our sins. Our sins. And the our includes you. Your sins were already paid for. You just need to act on it. You just need to do what you need to do. And of course, you're going to begin to explain as you go along what is required. So he died for our sins. He's a sacrifice, but he's also the substitute. He took my place on the cross. Substitution for our sins. Our, our sins, not his sin. He had none. Our sins. Greek word, therefore, that is used for, really deals with on behalf of or in the place of. So he died in my place 
Friend, he died in your place. Jesus' death was for you. And the you is the universal you, right? But you're talking to one person at that time. It's for you. He died for you. Just as though he died for me, he died for you. And that's important. And then, sins is so critical in the equation. Because you have a lot of good people today, you know. A lot of people say they are, they are good. I don't commit adultery. I don't smoke. I'm good. I'm morally good. But then, Paul spent so much time in the book of Romans before he pointed to Jesus Christ as, as the one who deals with the sins of all. He ensured that the world understood that all are sinners. All men are sinners. So whether you feel you're good or not, you are a sinner. And Christ died for your sins. Sins deals with the missing of the mark. Missing the bullseye. Missing God's righteous judgment. Moral standard of God. All of us missed it. And so he came and he died for us. So the critical area is, of course, Jesus died. And then the basic, the foundation of this is the scriptures. He talked about he, he received it. It was delivered to him and he, and he shared it. So the scriptures, according to the scriptures, our authority, brethren, is in the word of God. As we seek to minister to people, we stand on the word. If the word cannot do it, it cannot be done. Can't be done. Can't be done. God's word is powerful. God's word is powerful. And we don't need to find a substitute. The word of God is powerful all by himself. It's powerful. We just need to share it. Share it. Simply sticking. But very potent, very powerful. And then, of course, he just didn't die, but he is alive. Resurrection. He rose from the grave. After fulfilling that which he declared, after dying, after three days, he said, you know what? It's time to get up. He got up. And he was seen. Seen. By countless people, he rose from the grave. And that's an important element in this great gospel. Because a dead savior couldn't do it. Paul talked about if, you know, if we had hope in this life, of all men, we would be most miserable. If, if that's what we had, we'd be miserable. But we not only have hope in this life, but because of Jesus' resurrection, we have hope in the life to come. And, and in talking to unsaved um, souls, individuals, we need to deal with this matter too. That it is not true that you just live and you die and then that's the end of the story. There is a resurrection of the godly, the righteous, and the unrighteous. There is a resurrection. And the Bible tells us that after the resurrection, there is going to be an assessment made by the judge. God is going to judge all men based on their works shall be. So, there, so that's not how it is. You just live and die and that's the end of the story. No. You are going to rise from death. To die as you know it no more. Every soul will spend eternity somewhere. 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 And the beauty about 
the end of that is you and I, the soul, in his lifetime, his or her lifetime, determines the somewhere. So, those who take comfort in thinking that, okay, I can just live and die, and who cares what happens next? They need to think again, eh? And we need to allow that to be a part of our theology. I perhaps made a point some time ago, and I'll perhaps say it again. We need to be very careful with language, eh? Because sometimes we know somebody's not saved, and we say, oh, they're resting in peace. They're not. They're resting in pieces, and they're not even resting. And it's not a desire to be insensitive, but it's truth, isn't it? And you and I might allow people to go to hell because we're afraid to be truthful. People need to know that. Of course, you're not going to be insensitive where you have to speak truth. Preacher, the evangelist, must be a preacher of righteousness, truth, even when it's painful, cannot compromise. Amen? Because when we compromise, people are going to suffer because they're expecting us to be truthful. If anybody's going to be truthful, it should be the Lord's evangelists. And that, that's who we are. So the Great Commission deals with and you see it in the book of Matthew chapter 28. It, it talks about, well, let's read it. And Jesus spake, came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Isn't that a bold but true declaration? All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All power. All power. Think about that. I can't even fathom what that looks like. All power. Is given unto me in heaven and earth. Then he said, as a result of this, this is your command. Go. Now that the all power is given unto me helps with the go. Because in going, there are going to be obstacles. There are going to be frightening circumstances sometimes, right? But the one who possesses all power in heaven and earth told me to go. And because I'm walking in his will, I don't need to be intimidated. It was for that reason, I believe, that the prophet of the Lord was able to look at the even leadership of the day and say, you can't have your brother's wife. It wasn't our church he was preaching this, you know. He was preaching this to even ungodly, unsaved men and he's saying you can't do this. John looked at him so that's not right. This is against the word of God. How could he say that? He knew all power is given, belongs to his God and he's now in the process of going. So you and I must do a couple of things and it's right there in the scripture. We must go. Go. Take that literal at first. Go. Go deals with, in the context of this, deals with a deliberate intent. Deliberate intent. I'm going, I'm transitioning from where I am to where hungry people are. And my one purpose or focus is to bring Jesus Christ to them. Going. It's a decision I would have made. Go. When I go, I must, must teach all nations. Teach. And remember, what, if you are saved, you have a message. You have a lesson. If you are saved, you have something to share. Never underestimate the power of your personal experience with God. You go and share it. Tell them. Tell them how you got saved. Tell them what you used to do. 
and how God changed you. So you're teaching all nations. And then they ought to be baptized, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So baptism comes next, prerequisite, eh? And um, I, I won't spend the time to elaborate on that. I do hope that we're all fully persuaded that baptism must be done in Jesus' name. As I thought about that, I remember a little clip we saw some time ago uh, with, what's his name? Barry G. If you're from Jamaica, you probably know Barry G. Years he's on the radio. Barry G on the radio. And you always, and recently, um, sent it to one of my friends for conversation on it. A couple of them, actually. So he was at this, um, he was with some Baptists. And they were doing a baptism. And, you know, they said, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. And at the end, he said, in Jesus' name. <laughs> so, I said it to some of my sparring partners to have a conversation. And it, and I, it was just so ironic. Funny. You could, right at the end, it was very clear, though. said, in Jesus' name. So, I was saying to one of my brothers, you know, these brethren might be a little confused, it seems. And so they are just trying to use everything they've got. So in the process of using everything, one must be right. <laughs> but you and I know, we don't have to go through all of that, right? We know truth. You must be baptized. As you would see every baptism, I might just say that for every baptism that is done in the scriptures, when the church was, was, was born, every last one of them was done using the name. Well, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ or in the name of the Lord in the, or in, in the name of Jesus, whatever baptism is done using a name and, and not titles. Let's go on. If you have a question on that, we could come back. But I think I'm talking to the converted. Then in verse 20, teaching them to observe all things. The job of the evangelist is to be a participant in the discipleship of the convert. We don't just work with somebody and see them fill and say, okay, yes, I've got a star in my crown. Come on. They might lose that, that star if you don't keep at it. Discipleship. You want to see that person grow, mature, so that they too can become a disciple and be a participant in the process of discipling somebody else. Amen. In Mark 16, 15, and these shall go, and he said unto them, go, see the action taken, go. Where? The scope of the influence? All the world. I want you to influence your world. Isn't that what the disciples did? They went everywhere. Somebody said wherever they went, one of two things would happen. There would be revival, or the city would be burning, riot. But something is going to happen where they show up. Revival or riot. And oftentimes the riot led to a revival. The name of the Lord is preached. Somebody is thrown into jail so that the city could have a testimony of the power of God. So our intention must be the scope of our influence is everybody. And what must we do? What is the activity? Preach the gospel. Who should be targeted? Every creature. Every creature. The boss, the supervisor, the whoever, souls, must be targeted. Lord, how can I introduce you to so-and-so? Lord, give me the opening. And all of a sudden, the person comes and says, could you pray for me? Or could you, I know you go to church, could you add me on your prayer list? And something starts there. That person would have given you an opportunity 
to have that full conversation that you always wanted to have with them. I prayed for you. Could we have a Bible study? Could we discuss the scriptures over lunch? An opening. And we have to be able to see these as openings and begin to maximize those opportunities. Amen? Amen. Now, you and I know that everybody, to be a part of the church, we must be born in the body. We must be born into it. We must be born into it. Everybody around you, and they are not yet saved, they must be born into it. We see that in St. John chapter 3, Jesus said unto him, let's go back up to verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, same came to Jesus by night, said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. He kind of, Jesus had an influence on him. And he came. He was a man of position. He was a man who had authority. He was one of the big fishes, you would call it. Big fishes now in terms of the position where he sat. And the influence that he could have over his community. If he is impacted. See that, brethren? So, he came to Jesus by night to have a private conversation. And you know why he came by night, right? No one about it to see him. But then he could not help himself because in as much as he was concerned about the, 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 the masses, his associates, something was happening internally. Something was happening. And he said, you know what? I have to find a way to talk to him about this. Can't come in the day. But I can come at night. The cover of darkness. I can just slip away to have a one-on-one. -on -one. And look at what happened. So the conversation started. He told him what he thought. Verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Truly, truly, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Isn't that, was that a polished statement? He told them truth. He said, listen, if you're not born again, you can't even see it. Straight to the point. Jesus tend to be like that in his, his, his evangelism. Just get right to it. Nicodemus saith unto him, I have a problem. How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Because Jesus is telling him that for you to see it, you must be born again. You can't join this. This is not the Sanhedrin. This is not the council of the elders where you, can, you can't just join it. You have to be born into it. Born again. And he was confused. Because this theology was foreign to him, obviously. Because he's associating this born again experience to going back into his mother's womb. So he reasoned. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot absolute term again. See that, brethren? Absolute term. Cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So, to enter, you must be born of water and of spirit. We have to be able to convey that truth to people. Going around the bush won't cause them to be born in the kingdom. They need to know what they ought to do. Two things may happen. At least two. They may walk away vexed. That's okay. What were you and I supposed to do anyway? Preach the word. He that what? Believeth and is. My job is not to save anybody. I can't. As evangelists, our job is to share it, to preach it, truth. And oh, God, I really want them to respond, of course. But I must be comfortable in knowing that I did what I'm supposed to do. 
Jesus didn't back away with the rich young ruler. He gave him truth. And he said, it's too much. I can't stay. You and I, in seeking to win souls, we are going to have moments like that. People say, listen, this is too hard for me. I can't deal with this. And you just have to go on because you can't save anybody. So he told him exactly what he needed to do. And he went on and saying to him, marvel not that I say unto thee, don't be astonished. You must. See again the, the language there. He must, must be born again. Must. So how can I tell people that you know what? You can just enter in. Must be born again. Must. You know, one of the greatest concerns I've got, I've got a few, not a lot. One of them is for us to be having church, but not having an impact on unsaved people. You know, one of the things I despise the idea of unsaved people walking into a, to a building anywhere. Let's say they are in a church and leave that building and they were never challenged. Never challenged. I, that, I, that doesn't sit well with me. If, they, if you come to the hospital, I, I, I know what you need. And I can't just be having a bad day today so I'm just going to sit and watch you. No. I'm going to ask you. I'm going to try to converse with you. If I'm preaching, I'm, I'm going to be preaching. Can you, you know, I have never, nobody has ever asked me to preach at a wedding. But I know the message that I would preach. The same one. A good old message. Because while it's a, perhaps disqualify myself now, eh? But, sorry, because I'm looking in the congregation and it's a happy time. But I'm seeing some people that perhaps they'll never come back to church. And this is my one shot. And I'm a preacher first. I'll probably put a little humor someplace. But I'm going to come out with truth. I'm going to find a way of connecting marriage to salvation. And that's easy going to put it there somebody must be challenged because they come to church they, they came and said would you perform our wedding and so forth church you come what do you expect to get in church good fellowship good prayer good hospitality and a good word funerals are easy you just preach I don't talk about the dead. Or I don't preach about the dead. You give your condolences and you mean it and you connect with family and you understand they're grieving. But there are some people in that service. It's the first time they come into service for the year start. And they have no plans to come back until perhaps another time like that. And I don't know if they're going to come back. I don't know if they have another time. So I'm telling them the word. So when I go on my knees afterwards, I would have felt that I have done what the Lord wanted me to do. The occasions, I refuse to allow those occasions to, to cause me to lose focus of what church is. I believe everything we do in church must be strong. There must be a strong sense of evangelism attached to it. Strong sense. If we're having a fish fry for the community, oh no, Jesus is going to have to get in that fish fry somewhere. Yes. Must. If we're giving some bottle of water, Jesus is the living water. Come on, find a way to put him in there. Because that's our first responsibility. Church is not a social service. We don't exist to 
meet every single physical needs of communities. Now, if we can, we must, we should. But we don't want to get to a place where we become akin to the Salvation Army and disregard the souls of people. Jesus preached and preached and taught hard. And when he was finished, they were hungry. Wear them out, I suppose. And he said, all right, come eat some food. But you can't divorce word from, from the other social things that we do. Jesus must be, come on, after all of this is over, somebody needs to be saved, right, brethren? And we, we, we cannot afford to miss opportunities. Let's run on and close out. Now, you see it there, slide 22. Um, you know those, what one needs to do to be saved, right? It's listed right there. There are people who, let's go to the other one. We're going to close out in a moment. There are people who say, you know what, I, this personal evangelism thing, I can't do it. Again, please remember, brethren, look at what Jesus said here in Matthew 4, 18 to 20. Jesus and Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, verse 19, follow me. And what? Who is going to make them? When I talked earlier about everything is predicated, the very first point, the right relationship. If you follow, and that's what the right relationship is all about, you know. If I'm following Jesus in the right relationship, he's going to do the making. He's going to make me a fisher of men. He's going to make me. It's automatic. It comes naturally. Because I'm following him. And because he is the greatest fisherman there ever was and ever will be. I don't have to be worried. Remember that instance when all the disciples were trying to catch fish? And they'd do it all night and caught. Not even a ticky ticky. And let me just show up and say, listen, guys, let me show you what to do. Cast the net. And what happened? Couldn't manage. And not just, he caused the fishes to come. So if I'm following him, he's going to make me. But the key, and the key, verse 20, look at what they had to do. The response. Personal evangelists, look at their response. Verse 20. And they straightway, straightway, think about that. Immediately, straightway, left their nets and followed him. So what do you think happened? We know the end of the story. They became fishers of men. They turned their world upside down. Why? Because they were following him. Relationship. When we have right relationship, we must win souls. We must impact spaces and communities. Because we have right relationship. All right, so this is a little work. The last one for tonight. How many persons we have here tonight? Give me a quick count. 42. Thank you, Sister Gordon. You don't find it a wife, find it a good thingy. Eh? <laughs> so, 42. Now, let's think about it. So, there are 42 of us in this room tonight. What if each of us would work with the Lord to be a personal evangelist? To one person, one soul, and we stayed with it and we worked hard, and that one soul by the end of the year is saved. How many would that be, Sister Gordon? The 42, and each of us, 84. 84. That's like a year. So we are midway the year. Let's just say, but for the year, that's, that's 84. That's 100%, right? No, I want you to see the impact of that. Just see the impact of that. 
chances are that 42 um, might be 42 different families. Hmm? 42 different families. And of that 42, perhaps 10% might be men. Perhaps. Usually the numbers far less male, the ratio is less, right? So that's what says 42. 42 families that we are touching. New families. So we start the new year, let's say with that 84. And the 84, because that period of time is spent in not just winning the person, but discipling the person. The next year, 2023, the 84 souls, Lord willing, let's hold that to be so, right? That 84 begin to work again for the new year and each person win one. How much is that? 84 times two. One how much? 164? Hmm? 168? 168. 84 times 84. Time plus 84. 168. Thank you, guys. Thank you, brethren. 168. You see what I'm saying? Now, how hard it is in one year to work with one soul to see them saved. Is that super hard? Just one soul for 12 months? I don't think that's super hard. But, but look at the outcome. Working with the Lord, because we can't save anybody. But we know God wants people to be saved. 168. Now, if we were to talk about the year after that, the Lord willing, and that 168 again, discipled, mature, and, and we work together to win one soul. How much is that? 168 times two. How much is that? No. So while you work that out, do we have a shortage of people? Is it that there's not enough people to, to, to reach? We don't have a shortage of people, right? Whole lot of people in our Jerusalem, just our Jerusalem, you know. Our homes and the next door neighbor and beside us, the shopkeeper up the street. There are a lot of people. Think of what will happen. You know what we'd have to do if we kept on growing like that? We'd have good problems. Good problems. So if, if we, and, and what you're going to find, people are going to come in who, they, they come in with giftings, callings on them. Just need to be properly nurtured, discipled, which would be what we were doing. And so you have more Sunday school teachers. After a while you have to say, listen, no more Sunday school classes can hold here. So you know what we want to do when the weather is good? We have some roving Sunday school teachers, a set of 15, two teacher per group, and they spend that one hour just going through the community, knocking on some gate, sitting on the corner, and holding a meditation from the scriptures with some guys on the corner, impacting new people. Now, what would the, when, when we have other activities to do, you just see the ripple effect of, of, of that? More people to serve in different areas. Every area of the church should be better. To be more work for the leaders. When the leaders are smart enough, multiplication is going to happen. So after a while, as that continues, you know, brethren, every day this place would have to be open. And after a while, we'd have to have a staff because we are going to have to have several situations. So probably youth president would have to get our own staff full time. Every day, planning, working, putting things together, the Sunday school director. Why? Because multiplication is happening. And the system that we have is not sufficient to effectively minister to all those who are coming in. See the point I'm making? The impact this place couldn't hold us. We'd have to start extension churches 
different places. And that's good because the gospel is going to reach new places. So we're closing out tonight. But I wanted us to, to see that. To, to, to have a glimpse of that. To grab onto that. And not to be satisfied with ourselves. And we love each other. And we love to see each other. That's important. But there's a world that is dying. And we are the ones who need to share Jesus Christ with this world before it is too late. So, my eyes must be opened to see those around me who need Jesus Christ. And I must begin to realize that I don't need to be well-versed to be an evangelist. I can share whatever I have learned. And I'm a, I'm a necessary and valuable member in the Lord's army. And even if I'm not with the group, when I'm out there at work, wherever, I'm with the Lord because we're having a relationship. And he's going to lead people my way. Because he has a lot of souls that need to be saved. So brethren, I um, don't know if there are any questions on this lesson tonight. Um, but let us remember that we are called to be, we are personal evangelists, all of us. We have a duty, sacred duty. Paul recognized how important it was. Paul talked about uh, he went from house to house. He didn't hide it. And even when he was in prison, he was sharing it. He impacted every, everyone who came his path. You know what Paul had? The same Holy Ghost Paul received. You and I were spirit-filled. We have received it too. Paul was committed. Workman. Amen. Uh, we have a couple. You have a question? You, you want to get a mic for Sister... Uh, Any other question, brethren? Anybody else after uh, Sister Edwards? All right. Praise the Lord, everyone. This is not so much a question, but as we are on the topic of personal evangelism, I remember some years ago, I used to travel by the train regularly. And one evening I was coming home and um, the Spirit said to me, witness. And I, I, my heart started pounding. And I said, witness, how, what, what should I say to these people? Right? And I, I ignored it. I ignored the voice. And um, I told somebody about it. And she said, you, you, you lost your opportunity to witness. And the following day, the same thing happened. The voice came back to me and said, witness. And I said, I'm not going to lose this opportunity. And I got up and uh, I positioned myself in a car that, you know, the majority, everybody could see. And I just started witnessing. I don't know where the words came from, but everything flew in place. And it was, you know, uh, it was from Manhattan and you have a lot of Hispanics and all these people. Some were on their telephone, some were reading and all of these things. And as I started and I went on, I, I was watching what was going on while I was talking, and most of them stopped reading and, you know, and was listening to what I was saying. And um, when I was near getting off the train on one evening, when I got off, somebody came and touched me while I was going through the turnstile. After I, I, I witnessed, I prayed. And when I got off the train and was going through the turnstile, I went through the turnstile going on, I, I felt something on my shoulder. And when I turned around, it was this girl. And she said, Miss, thank you for what you said. Everything was for me. 
My name is Cherise. I'm asking you to pray for me. And I did that for a long time. And every time I remember I met, uh, I went, uh, on one occasion, this guy came to me and said, are you an apostolic? I said, yes. And we started a conversation. And this went on. And I saw every evening I did it. People responded by looking and asking and, you know, saying little things. And I just want to say this, that sometimes fear will kill us and we lose our blessings. But if you trust God, he will help you to overcome fear, right? Because he has given us the power. And we should not sit down as if God has done nothing for us. Somebody is out there wanting to hear this because you have people on, on the train all the time and on the bus saying things which are really garbage, right? And they don't stop. So we have the real thing. And if God has really done anything for you, you should not keep it quiet. When I just got saved, you know, I work in a reputable firm in Jamaica. And from general manager straight down, I witnessed to. Until one, on one of occasion, the, the financial controller told me that he hasn't killed anybody. And he didn't do this and he didn't do that. But at the end, he had to agree with what I was saying. So you have to overcome fear. We are God's children. And God has given us the ability there is no greater thing than what God has done in our lives. He transformed us. Put the Holy Ghost in us. So what are we afraid of? The world is dying and, and they are depending on us to bring the truth to them. So don't be afraid. God will help you. Just seek his faith. Amen. Amen. Thank you for sharing, Sister Edwards. Now, just before Bishop comes in, you know, brethren, very good point, Sister Edwards. Oftentimes, you know, it's just that first word. It's just a start. Once you overcome that element of fear, you're going to look back at yourself and say, oh, wow, it's not as hard as I thought, you know? Bishop, over to you, sir. Yes, sir. Myself, was, as a young man, when I just got saved, I was scared. Scared to testify. One day, I don't know, I was going from and go to Mount Ogle to preach. Again, my young days, I was still in Bible school. And I started an argument and asking them, the, the, the man that was standing, if he's saved. And from then, he started talking about baptism and the filling of the Holy Ghost. A lot of a lot of folks, a lot of folk hear the gospel. But I was on a bus and I didn't care what what anybody else say. Now, this is good teaching, sir. This is a good teaching. I like the way the Lord is working. Praise the Lord. I, I, I have seen something that caught my eyes in 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 in, in lesson twenty three, yes. where Jesus called two brothers. And what I noticed when he called them, they were fishers of fish. But after he called them, he said, I will make you fishers of men. He definitely told them what I want you to do. Fish for men. And remember when Peter and others go back to the to fish, they didn't count anything. Praise the Lord. And so the Lord came and told them to put it on the right side. <laughs> but if we will throw our net on the right side, 
we're going to catch men. And the Lord in this area, because this, what I noticed, the community has changed. It's about five changes since I've been here. The people that move out, new one come in. And our job is to reach them. So I encourage all of us, and thank you, sir, for the word of the Lord. It enriched me and taught me, and I wish I could run. <laughs> but I believe the Lord have me for a purpose. Amen. There is a purpose Amen. for me being sick. Believe me, there's a purpose he has me here. Amen. And all I have to do is to wait in the Lord. Amen. Whatever he wants to do, Amen. let him have his way. Amen. Thank you. May the Lord bless you. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. Amen. No other question. We're going to uh, stand and uh, we are going to pray before we go tonight. Uh, I didn't see another answer. We could start. Brethren, um, we still have our VBS going. Uh, today was day two. Tomorrow is, Lord willing, is the third day. And uh seemed to me that they have been having a very good time. I uh, just popping in and out. Um, so some fantastic uh, brethren who are volunteering themselves. And uh, if you have time and you want to come and volunteer, sure, it will be appreciated. Some of the brethren, they come, um, can't come every day. Um, some persons, it seem to me, take off a couple of days just to give and then to go back. Um, so brethren, we have a couple of more days to go, God's willing, if you can. Um, of course, we'd appreciate your assistance. Yes. There you go. Oh, yes, I see him down there very engaged, very engaged. Uh, we, we thank um, our, our leaders, Sister Smith and her team. Um, God bless you for what you do. Amen. Um, Lord willing, on Friday, um, you, you have that one up? The, the youths are going to be, some of them are going to go to Pastor Nayaka for a um, fire conference. Starts at 7.30. You heard the announcement on Sunday. Um, talk with Sister Milton um, if you need transportation. Then, Lord willing, on Saturday, we go, God's willing, of course, to to watch Brother David, <laughs> uh, sight and sound. Um, we were told on Sunday, Sister Johnston gave us the full, what's that term? The full hundred. Um, we meet at six, God's willing. Um, the bus leaves at 6.45. Uh, nobody will be calling you for five minutes, Sister Johnston, because if we do that, everybody might ask for five, and we don't leave, so... 6.45, if you're not on spot, then we will send you the, the what, what's that thing called, Sister Candice? You can find on YouTube of it. Uh, what was that? The highlights, not the link. Just tell you what it's about. Yes, and you can watch it for four hours. Just keep rolling it. <laughs> well, you'd miss the fun. So I'm looking forward to that, the Lord willing. I'm looking forward not just to the presentation, but just to, for us to be together. God's willing, I know we're going to be in two different buses, but I believe we're going to have good fellowship together, and that's very apostolic. Amen, brethren? Just to laugh and eat and talk and give jokes and just have a good time. The dozers will be dozing on the way and just good time together. That's very important, brethren. 
And so we look forward to that time together. Amen. Let's keep praying for each other. Um, Bishop Sibyl is there having their 42nd church anniversary service on Saturday and on Sunday, God's willing. Of course, we're going to be out so we can support on Saturday. Uh, Lord willing, on Sunday morning, I'll leave just before worship service to go and worship with them uh, for their Sunday morning service. I want you to be aware of that. If you don't see me, some of you won't because you're not coming early for Sunday school. So you won't see me, um, but I'd leave perhaps just after Sunday school to go and worship with them over there. Let's pray for them, 42 years. Uh, let's pray that God's will, will be done. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together so we can go. I, uh, Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Let's join together and pray. We thank you for your favor. Thank you for every person in this room. Everybody in this room is very special to you. We are your people. There is nobody in this room that is less valuable to you. Calvary was for every one of us. And if it was just that one, if it was any one of us, there would have been a Calvary. We are grateful to you. We thank you for fellowship. We thank you that it's beautiful. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity thank you for every member in this room every guest that might be in this room tonight all our young people all our seniors our children we thank you for every last one of them i pray that your purpose will be fulfilled in our lives thank you lord god almighty for all our leaders in this room thank you for just your faithful laborers who serve in so many different areas pray that your hands will rest upon every last one pray for our families too that you'd go before us and that you'd grant us good success pray for coverage lord god pray that your kingdom will come pray that you'd bless the gift oh god as we give in the offerings tonight those who are not able to give we pray that you would provide cover us we ask as we go help us lord to just walk in love walk in fellowship Oh, God, as you have called us to, we thank you. We pray your kingdom will come in all our lives. We pray your will will be done. Somebody say, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Give us unto the Lord in the offerings. Please greet somebody. Greet each other before you go. It's good to have, I see several of our young people here tonight. Um, several of you, it's so good to have you in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. This place looks so much more lively because you are here young people we really do appreciate every last one of you god bless you let's keep praying for sister henry brethren uh, let's keep praying for her amen <laughs>